Welcome back to Channel Water. This episode will be focusing on one issue and the fact that we can't see water. We don't see water itself. We can see the body of water and know that it's there. But the fact that we can't see water itself, its movement, its activity, has really affected our relationship with water and the way we treat water, the way we talk about water, the way we collaborate with water. And the main thing, it affects our theories about life, evolution, religion, all of those are affected by the fact that we cannot see the one active agent in nature. So is water invisible? Clear, transparent, whatever word you use. You can always see what is inside of water. You can see through it. You can swim in water and still see. As far as the physicality of it, light goes through water. It just passes through physically, weaving through the water molecules. That movement through also bends light. So we know that the water is there because light was deformed and bent, but light goes through the water as if it wasn't there. So we will cover a few specific points that I feel are affected by the fact that we cannot see water and its activity. The first one is just the way we talk, the way we talk about water, both in our definitions, if you look at the dictionary, and in our thought, in the way that we perceive water. In the dictionary, it's quite a funny term or definition for water. They describe everything that it's not. Water is odorless, colorless, tasteless, and plain simple, all of our senses cannot pick up on water, basically. It's not something we smell, it's not something we taste, it's not something we see. So water has been absent from our vision, and it's been absent from our mind, too. Mainly, what is absent is seeing the activity in water, seeing that water is an active agent. It's active, it's moving, um, it's making and building. This is a block of soil made by water, us human beings, and that block of soil will never do anything on its own. It will never move, will never build, it will never change. The only things that will change it is water. The atmosphere, temperatures, movement, rain. So visually we can see soil. It's something that we can detect. We can see all the different elements. And we see that they never do anything. They never move, they never create, build, or do. In the case of water, we don't see that. So we can't relate to the activities that are happening because we can't see them. It's not surprising that our theories of evolution and all of our scientific theories are based on randomness, are based on no one doing nothing. There's nobody actively, consciously making, building, moving, or doing anything. That is really where the knowledge of water comes in and serves as the missing link in our theories of evolution. Because suddenly we realize that somebody is doing something, somebody is active, and somebody is building. More than that, something on this planet is inherently alive and conscious. But that something has been invisible from our eyes until now. It is interesting how, at the same time, we have our whole world of theories about uh, energies, gods, spirits, and all of them are invisible. We have never thought of those things as not invisible. They're always been invisible, and because of that, out of reach, out of they're not tangible. They're not, we're not sure 
Is there a soul? Is there consciousness? Is the spirit here or there? Where is it? I think that every spirit has a physical manifestation. There's no detachment. There's everything has a tangible physical manifestation in this reality that we are in. I am conscious, I have a body, that is my state. There's no um, separation between the two. So if you start by looking for that invisible world, where would you start? There is an invisible layer of matter on this planet. Water and water vapor, the air. When I first understood that I cannot see water, it really took me by a surprise. It, it was something that I wasn't ready for. Because when we are born, we're born into a world. It has certain conditions, and we take them as granted. I feel like just like moving from the flat world into the round, whole world, in the same way we're going through that process now with water, understanding the full picture and the whole circle that it provides. And rather than a flat, two-dimensional view that we have right now of water, there's a three-dimensional view that is more complete and full that um, we will get to here. There's two worlds that try to explain how we got here, what we are, what this place is. One world talks about only the who and why, which we know as religion. The other world talks about the how, and only the how, physically how things came to be. And that's the world of science. Between those two worlds, it seems like there was never a connection. And the gap between them seems to be too big to bridge. But once you start working with water, you start to see the connection between those two worlds. You see the who and the how at the same time. At the time that people wrote books like the Bible or any of those theories of the time, they did understand that there's something bigger, a unifying field between all life. They obviously could not explain how. How life came to be physically through an actual... Um, they just couldn't explain that. They had no microscopes, they had no tools or the scientific measurements that we have today. So they described what they could. Today we have an opposite view which goes with we're only going to talk about what we see and can analyze and describe precisely through experiments and repeated experiments too. But that world doesn't allow for um, an agent, an entity or existence of consciousness within it. So we have one theory saying there's consciousness building itself a home. We have another saying there's a home that has achieved a level of consciousness. The two cannot <laughs> exist without the other, actually. And uh, once you work with water, you start to see that there is no contradiction. There is an element that is, in fact, active and building and making. And at the same time, you see the how over millions of years, one cell at a time, following the map of evolution, which is, the map is correct, but um, the randomness of it is not. So today, the reason we're talking about this is again through the fact that we cannot see water, we cannot see activity, then we attribute activity to passive elements that are not active. For example, it's like saying that this house built itself rather than somebody built it, which is me. Uh, we talk about plants, we talk about animals, we talk about all those architecture, vehicles, structure, as if they were the thing itself and they built themselves. So we can see everything but the architect and the dweller in those structures. That's the reason our theories are the way they are right now, which is full of randomness, passiveness, attributing activity to things that are not active, and taking away activity from those who are. 
Um, I don't want to get too much into that now because we'll have a full episode about the theory of evolution and how water is the missing link in that theory. Another way that not seeing water affects us is in our lack of collaboration with water. Water is an active agent. Um, it has a lot of abilities that we haven't yet explored and also behaviors. Water behaves. It has certain patterns of behavior just like people have. We can use those patterns. We can use those behaviors and the will of water in our work. Now, the main thing is we, we are, as I say, the hands of the ocean. These hands are made to work in large scale and reshape this world in that scale. At the same time, we still have a lot of work to do in the much smaller scale. And that's where water can be our hands in that scale and help us in many different things from healthcare to different industries. And both, it's, it's in small scale, but in large quantities. So there is a lot of work that can be achieved. And I feel that many of our future discoveries that are coming our way will be through collaboration with water. So healthy water means healthy people, healthy animals, healthy plants. And that's the true meaning of collaboration between us and water. Keeping water healthy is keeping ourselves healthy. Water is the soul, the spirit. It is the thing we want to keep pure and clean. I'm amazed of how much care we give to graveyards, ashes of dead people, holy lands, all kind of worship of passive elements of soil, basically. Worshipping soil. There's a lot of soil in space. Every star you see around you that is, is nothing but a dead piece of rock that is floating in space. It might have a certain vibration, certain level of consciousness, but I'm talking here specifically about active elements, water. If you're floating in space, and just yesterday I heard on the radio an astronaut describing being in space looking back at Earth, and he said, that's what heaven looks like. When you're out there looking at all those dead planets, and you see that blue marble, alive, moving, movement all over in its atmosphere and its oceans, when you see that blue planet, you realize where heaven is, where consciousness is the spirit, activity, creativity, bringing something out of nothing. The fact that we made this little silly thing out of some thought, that's what consciousness means. I have yet to see on another planet anything being made by any rock. So the worship, the care that we give, again, soil, we need to examine that our attachment to matter, and again, because we can see it, because we can connect to it through that. If you could see water, you would not even have a fish in your tank fridge. You would just be looking at water moving and it's beautiful form and it's um, just exciting, just water. Another aspect that not seeing water affects us is our identity, what we learn about ourselves, who we are, what we are. And um, as I mentioned in the previous video, we are like a baby born into an environment and slowly learning about the environment and about the self and about the relationship between the two. So until now, we have identified ourselves with this planet, Mother Earth, with the soil, the rock, the ashes. But my goal is that by the end of this channel or through communicating this knowledge, we will adjust our identity to one of water. We are sea creatures walking in space to gain our true identity helps align our rights and the way we treat ourselves. 
because the way we mistreat water right now is actually equal to the way we mistreat ourselves through the emphasis we put on, on matter, objects, land, soil, rather than on our own health and well-being walking into the future. So as a, as a species, we are water creatures. Water is a birthright. And people ask, what does that mean? Well, water, by, by our own laws and constitution, clean, clear water is a right every man has. Yet, as we all know, that's not something we keep. Even though cities pay their taxes and do everything they need to do, whole infrastructures of water systems collapse, people are getting poisoned, and, and that promise, that contract we have with a city is broken. And a lot of people don't take that with the seriousness it needs to be taken. A city immediately should be sued and be liable for their failure to fulfill their contract. We do not pay taxes for wars. We pay taxes for, first of all, for infrastructure so we can be healthy, functional being and fulfill our job and our duty as citizens. Because to be a citizen is also a contract. So I feel that it is very important for us to find our true identity. We are missing the unifying field. Water is the unifying field between all organic beings. That's what an organic being means. You're made out of a mixture of water and soil. That's organic. So between the plants, animal, human being, there's one spirit, one soul, one consciousness that has built all of them in a continuous manner. There's no separation at any point. There's no one being on this planet that is detached from that buildup from the one cell to the 60, 70 trillion cells we see today walking around. That unified field is what provides the sense of belonging to any being here. With the identity of water, we also connect ourselves to a bigger picture in the whole universe. There's a lot of water in the universe. And we will connect to those different bodies of water. We will connect all those dots out in space in a much bigger space. This is just a beginning. This is just a really simple young being on this planet. Water can sense a lot of the things around it. And it senses each other. So that's why it doesn't need any additional sensors to sense water. Water doesn't need vision to see water. It needs vision to see everything but itself. As a photographer, that's something that's very familiar to me because every time I take a picture or design a tool for vision, it's designed to see everything but the viewer because I'm here to view something else. I'm trying to understand something about my environment. We develop a lot of different eyes and ways of seeing and we develop also light that comes with it so for example mri x-ray thermal vision there's so many ways of seeing there are many different technologies and eyes developed by nature to see so our eye and this camera it's the same thing a technology invented by consciousness to be able to see but the eye and the camera is not an indicator to the size of the viewer. I could be standing behind a telescope the size of a building, looking out to space. I could be looking down a microscope that gets smaller and looking down at one particle. So again, all of those tools are not indicators to who the viewer is. Same for my body, my eyes, are most likely something in the scale of a telescope. 
huge telescope compared to the viewer that is in this body, which is water. Water is the one looking because it needs to manipulate, work, analyze, categorize, identify everything but itself. Every grain of soil, iron, copper, all those different elements, we find them, categorize them, and all have different colors. All of them beautifully sit on this spectrum of color and light wave that we can understand. So what is it that we look for in water? What do we look to see? Why is it even important? We went through all the different ways that in the way we treat water that it affects our relationship with it. But there's also another aspect. There's aspect of form, liquid dynamics. Water, we know, is the source of life. Whether you think it's an active agent in that story or not, Either way, it's important for us to find the form of movement in that element, in the source of life. What is movement? What form it takes in water? In the theory of evolution, form is random. Again, different mutations create different forms. The ones that fit the most the environment it's in, survives, moves on, all of that. So. It's somewhat functional, mainly random, and life goes on. But when phases of water happened, when I discovered a way to see water for the first time, those forms had no randomality to them. There was nothing random about those forms. Every time that I saw an image, it was both familiar I knew at the same time. It was both something that I feel is part of my world, yet out of this world. So understanding the original form, seeing those original basic forms of life, seeing forms that are familiar today means that those are not random. Those forms exist in nature. They exist in water, just water moving in water. That is like the wind. Wind currents are the same. So we are in water right now. It's all vapor of water. It's invisible. It's moving, um, flying to the different temperatures. Those are the currents, the winds. You don't see the wind unless there's dust particles in it, a hurricane. You'll start seeing that kind of like So the goal was to capture currents, to capture water moving in water, seeing those forms, those pure life forms. Then trying from those forms to understand life, the character of life. And when I first started seeing faces of water images, I started seeing the connections between the environment, the feelings, the emotions that were in the space at the time, and also the source of that water to the images, to the movements, to the characters in there. When you start seeing all those characters in the water, you start to see that form is actually it's just a manifestation of an intention in nature. So that intention, that character, as it moves through nature, it develops form. That form is like a symbol that represents back that intention and that character. So movements of characters, movies, movements of intention through our physical world take form. That form is a symbol, is an indicator of that intention behind it. And a simple example is a shark, a dolphin. They both have very similar colors, textures, but their form is so different and unique when you see them for the first time, you will know. Stay away from the shark, you can play with the dolphin. So there's a communication happening through form to show you its pure intention and movement, character. To make it more simple, we're talking about all those different vehicles 
that are being made by water. Water has a certain intention, a function it wants to achieve. It creates a vehicle to establish that. You can see the connection between character, intention, and form through our vehicles. If you want to drive very fast, and that's your character, and you'll be driving a sports car, it's a very different character from somebody that likes to go off-road and have a four-wheel drive and is driving a Jeep. You will see that their will to move in a certain way in the world affects the creation of those vehicles. Those vehicles are made to fit a character. It's not just to fit physically in the vehicle, but also to fit your character, your projection to the world, the way you see yourself. Whether you're a biker on a Harley Davidson or riding a bicycle on Venice Beach. The character is what drives the vehicle. The character it was brings the vehicle into life. The vehicle is actually passive. We use it, we drive it, and we feel good when the vehicle matches our character. So those feelings of comfort, those feelings of our intentions, our will, our way that we want to move about this world, is what shapes those vehicles and those forms. That intention started in water and is still rippling through the material world. But it is water that is driving and moving, and in its movement, it manifests a form that represents that character and that intention. And as we said before, in water there are infinite characters infinite intentions and you can see that all of our cars are, have four wheels and an engine yet not two are the same and then each person gets into their own vehicle and customizes it to their own wheel their own way you can find your vehicle in a huge structure full of them that's an interesting fact in a way if you think about it there is absolutely no reason for two cars to be different from each other, other than its functionality. No reason at all. If it wasn't for the creative nature, the individual conscious beings within water that have their own intention, their own will, their own character. So life is that fabric of infinite conscious individual water cells that then manifest themselves in these human cells and so on and so on. The cells will keep getting bigger, the vehicles will get bigger, and we'll keep moving out to space. I'm happy to share with you the first step I took into water to understand our relationship with it first in the physical level. And the first thing is to see, to see water for what it is, to see its activity, and its connection to us. So I hope today you will leave with a little more understanding of what we can and cannot see, why, and then once we do, what do we see? What is there in this invisible layer of water? So thank you for watching, and uh, don't carve anything I say in stone. <laughs>